Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the director of StorageX Initiative uh, and a professor in material science and engineering. I would like to welcome everyone to the final symposium for the winter quarter. Today, we're discussing a very exciting topic on battery management, prediction, and diagnostics. So let me give a bit of context on this topic. If you have seeing a battery gauge on your computer, on your smartphone, or for your electric vehicle, you have benefited uh, from the expertise of the two speakers today. In addition to being able to determine the state of the battery and the health of the battery, increasingly it has become important to also accelerate the pace of research and development for battery technologies, uh, especially for lithium ion, um, one of the reasons why it is so widely used is because of its lifetime. But this long lifetime also makes it very difficult to predict the performance of the battery and has been a bottleneck for the research and development process. So the field of battery informatics um, has been growing over the past decade where large data methods are being used to accelerate this process. And I am delighted to be hosting two of my colleagues who are world expert in this area in battery management uh, and prediction and diagnostic to talk about various aspects of this very important problem and uh, arguably one of the underpinning technology needed to speed up the energy transition. Uh, so we have today with us uh, Professor Simona Onori from Stanford University, my good neighbor uh, right here, and then also Professor Dirk Uwer Zauer, um, who is a, a chair professor at the RWTH University of Aachen in Germany. So to get us started, let me also uh, introduce uh, the director of the Precor Institute, Professor Yi Tsui, and he will introduce Simona. Yi? Well, thank you, Will. It's a great honor to introduce Simona, our young, but uh, really a young star colleague right here at Stanford University. Um, Simona joined Stanford several years ago uh, in the energy resources and engineering department. Soon, um, everybody is going to see we are going to have a new school of uh, on climate sustainability. I believe Simona will be moving into the new department called energy science engineering. Um, Simona has done really nice work on battery management are actually benefiting uh, from interacting with her quite a bit. Uh, she has won many awards. I will just mention uh, the uh, NSF Career Award. Uh, I look forward to many awards uh, she's going to win down the road. And uh, Simona, uh, take it from here. Thank you so much Eve, for the nice introduction. Thank you. Do I come through right? Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so good morning, everyone. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today uh, in front of this uh, uh, very educated audience to talk about um, uh, battery management system. And uh, I'm also very excited to uh, um, talk today with Professor Sauer from, from Germany, uh, who has been a leading expert in the field. And, uh, and as Will has mentioned initially, uh, we're gonna talk about battery manage management system. And this is, a, um, uh, I would say, a, a novel topic, a new topic within this uh, platform, the StorageX International Symposium. So, uh, so thank you for the opportunity to, to, um, to share with you, with all of you, uh, some of the work we're doing in my lab. Um, in, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at Stanford, I um, uh, lead uh, the Stanford Energy Control Lab, and I have the uh, pleasure to work with talented students, postdocs, undergraduate students, and the visiting scholars. And uh, broadly speaking, what we do here is to develop algorithms, so uh, software codes, and, uh, and to, uh, to make energy systems more efficient and last longer. So we really care about 
uh, uh, trying to extract the most of the performance out of the system once they are deployed in uh, given applications. The majority of the work uh, we are doing today is uh, centered on lithium ion batteries, although uh, we also look at uh, technologies related to after treatment systems like three way catalyst and the gasoline particulate filters um, and through, uh, the, through NSF support. So, um, we are, uh, broadly speaking, a dynamic system control optimization group, and uh, um, and I would like to kind of show you uh, the uh, the type of uh, things we look at. Uh, besides and outside the BMS. So hybrid electric vehicles is, uh, has, been has been the focus of our research for a, for a bit now. And uh, um, in hybrid vehicles, you have two sources of, uh, of, uh, of, of energy or power. And uh, one of the main challenge there is to how to decide which actuator to use at any given time. And over the past years, we look at uh, uh, formulating energy management strategies for, uh, for this problem. And, uh, and what we're doing today, on the other hand, is to kind of reframe all that problem in terms of exergy. Uh, exergy is the reversibility that you get uh, in the powertrain uh, and in the components. And uh, we, we're looking at modeling the exergy uh, dynamics within the powertrain and also uh, deploying some control solutions. Uh, electric vehicles are uh, being uh, analyzed and studied, and uh, uh, within this uh, type of uh, um, um, of vehicles of, of systems, we look at uh, driving cycle analysis, understand driving cycle dynamics, and to bring that knowledge back to the operation of the battery and uh, to understand how this information can benefit. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, design a battery, man battery management system. Uh, we look at different uh, opportunities to hybridize or electrify the, the system, uh, the, the, the vehicle. And so we, um, we you know, lithium ion batteries sometimes might not be the best and only solution to use. For example, in semi, electric, electrified semi, or even uh, military vehicles. And so we, we look at uh, uh, opportunities in that space where we um, combine, uh, for example, supercapacitors to lithium ion battery technology and also create optimization uh, routines to optimize their size. Battery packs is the most important components in electric vehicles. So we look at the BMS uh, battery pack uh, systems in terms of uh, uh, designing control estimation and uh, optimization strategies. And uh, we run high fidelity models to understand the dynamics of a battery pack. We use also, uh, we are um, looking at uh, understanding uh, field data from BMS and uh, uh, using uh, machine learning algorithms to interpret uh, and uh, filter and process uh, a huge amount of data that we get from the vehicles. Cells is the main component of a battery pack. So we, we work a lot around uh, understanding and modeling uh, the battery cell. And uh, uh, we develop uh, physics-based models, implement and code the physics-based models of different uh, uh, flavors uh, for battery cells in terms of electrochemical dynamics, thermal and, uh, and aging. And we use those models along with the uh, machine learning routines to uh, assess the health of the battery, understand the amount of charge in the battery uh, cells and also predict uh, uh, remaining useful life. We just started a new collaboration with uh, uh, a new sponsor uh, in the Michigan area on battery cell manufacturing. That's a new area for us. So we're very excited to uh, contribute with our work to the, uh, to the making of, of new um, um, electrochemical cells. So all of this uh, work is done uh, tackling uh, and using uh, fresh cells, so new, uh, new devices. But uh, uh, there is an impending problem today, which is reusing uh, um, and uh, recycling on lithium ion batteries. So we also uh, look at this challenge uh, in terms of understanding feasibility of uh, um, um, used batteries coming from retired battery pack uh, from EV into grid storage um, 
uh, as Gristo resolution to for smart grid application, for example. And, uh, uh, and so one of the challenges here is that uh, um, when we take those batteries out of uh, uh, electric vehicles, uh, there is really not much trust in what the BMS predicts in terms of battery life. So uh, the main question is, um, what's the health of those batteries? Are, are they good to be used uh, in a grid storage application? And if so, which grid storage application should be using and how long uh, do we expect the battery to last? That's a huge investment. Huge investment. So we need to be able to give those uh, quantitative answers, um, quantitative answer, answers to those questions. So the, my talk is gonna center on a battery cell and battery pack today. Um, I wanna just uh, uh, quickly go over uh, some you know, high level um, information here. In the US, we feel very strong the support of our government uh, uh, towards electrification of the transportation sector and uh, uh, the power sector. Uh, this is important to reduce greenhouse gases get away from uh, from petroleum and uh, therefore be diverse and especially and mostly also to improve national security and uh, we are um we read uh, you know these past two weeks have been very um very difficult um there is a war uh, happening in ukraine and uh, we are uh, feeling the effect uh, you know uh, of this war in uh, in our daily life um um, electric vehicles can support uh, uh, local communities, uh, so uh, low income and disadvantaged community can benefit from, for example, electrified uh, um, buses. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, is also going to um, um, happening is that the individual ownership of EVs is going to be um, coming possible for even more uh, more people. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, almost in uh, 2020. Uh, that was September 2020, and I'm sure people uh, Stanford remember uh, that week. It was a horrible week. The sky was red, and uh, this was taken at 2 p.m. on uh, I-280 um, when I was driving from San Francisco to uh, Palo Alto, and uh, and the air quality was uh, very unhealthy. As, uh, and, and that was uh, uh, a very, um, you know, um, scary situation, I would say. And that was uh, the effect of uh, a big heat wave that we had in California, uh, in Northern California, uh, the month prior. And that has revealed that our uh, electric um, grid was not capable to, or not flexible to, not even flexible to um, uh, provide the uh, demanded energy. So energy storage here can be used uh, to, uh, to, to create, to alleviate those, uh, uh, those situations that are uh, happening more and more often um, in, the, in the past year. The huge commitment uh, towards electric vehicles is not just from uh, out the government, uh, our government, also government around the world, but also from automakers. Automakers are making huge investment into this technology. And uh, if you have watched uh, the Super Bowl, um, the 2022 Super Bowl last month, you have noticed that the um, you know uh, there is more and more. There were more and more electric cars features in the commercials. And for the first time, there was also power wall uh, um, charger uh, feature. So they're really getting our house also from other uh, channels. So that's a, that's a, a very, uh, indeed, a very good news. Lithium ion batteries are the uh, key technology to unleash the market, uh, um, the mass market potential of, uh, of many, uh, many um, systems, not only electric vehicles, and we have seen also with consumer electronics and uh, uh, electric uh, uh, vacuum, but also grid storage and, uh, and, uh, and beyond that, heavy duty um, vehicles, uh, um, we have electric boats and uh, also unmanned vehicles. So it's happening, it's around us, it affects our day daily life in, uh, and uh, every, every minute, I would say, our daily life. Now, if we were talking maybe like a few months ago, we were praising the declining uh, uh, price of this technology. And we were also commenting on the fact that this trend uh, was a trend that we were, um, um, we used to see also when it comes to solar uh, technology, PVs. 
Uh, now, unfortunately, and so the, the, the price actually of lithium ion batteries technologies has declined almost 90% of the past decades. Now, uh, what we have uh, uh, seen recently, what we read on every day is the uh, supply chain crisis that has led the uh, cost of metals using the cathode material of this technology going uh, um, up to the roof. So cobalt, uh, the price of cobalt has, has doubled, uh, nickel is 15% uh, uh, more expensive. Uh, than the beginning of the years, and uh, and uh, I'm sure today there is going to be some other news related to this uh, increase of price. So, what's happening now? So, some of the forecast uh, says that uh, in this year we're going to have an up reverse trend in terms of uh, battery price, and uh, we'll see how this is going to play out in terms of uh, EV um, uh, sales. On the other hand, uh, you know, there are also new opportunities that are coming up of this uh, um, situation. One of which, for example, is uh, um, a new market of reused EV. So we're gonna have, um, we're gonna see more and more uh, used EV uh, sold, uh, um, you know, um, the dealers. And so uh, that will increase the uh, EV ownership. Um, so uh, last year, around, uh, uh, I think it was June of last year, the DOE issued the uh, national blueprint for lithium ion batteries. And this is a very nice document that you can download from the energy.gov website that was put together by the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries. And uh, what you see there, what you read there is a very nice uh, list of goals. There are five goals that uh, are very well stated to, uh, to improve uh, um, the uh, domestic uh, manufacturing and production of raw materials for batteries, manufacturing of uh, uh, electro cells and, uh, and packs. And, uh, um, and the idea is to try to really be uh, independent from uh, um, uh, from other countries, especially countries where there is some uh, political instabilities. And, uh, uh, and when I was reading this document, what really um, got my attention was the fact that there was a missing piece and uh, uh, which I, I believe should be added there. And that is the battery management system design. BMS design is such an important component of, the, uh, um, of this technology that should be recognized and acknowledged as such. And there requires a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of engineering around this, uh, uh, this component. Uh, and uh, uh, that also requires people to be educated in this field. And, uh, uh, and I hope to see this goal, this new goal um, in, the, in the next, uh, in the future. So different from what uh, E and my colleagues Ian will do on, uh, on a, uh, uh, daily, which is designing better batteries by discovering new materials, by optimizing the, uh, for example, uh, cathode materials and so forth. What we do um, in my lab is to uh, use control, uh, use uh, modeling to, uh, to maximize uh, uh, performance of the battery. So uh, how to use, uh, do we, how can we use the batteries better and uh, uh, to make them last longer? And, uh, and so uh, what we need to do is to recognize the fact that around the battery cell and battery pack, now there is a whole new um, uh, framework, a new infrastructure, which is a, a set of sensors, wiring, packaging, and uh, uh, communications. And, uh, uh, and uh, that needs to be incorporated into the study of this, uh, um, the design of uh, BMS. Uh, quickly speaking, uh, there are, I want to just uh, uh, mention that um, uh, there is no, you know, when you talk about lithium ion batteries, we talk about family of, uh, of chemistry that uh, um, mainly different from the uh, materials using the positive electrodes. And, uh, um, and uh, depending on the application you're using this technology for, you might want to select uh, one technology versus the other. Uh, although there are also other implications like costs and supply chain crisis that needs to be accounted for. But one thing that I wanted to, um, to have your attention on is the fact that um, not only different chemistries, for example, in the form of MCA or MC and LFP, they have different uh, uh, specific energy, specific power, 
our content uh, when you excite them a different uh, C rate, so amplitude, current amplitude of operation. But one uh, distinct difference among these, uh, mm, uh, these chemistry is their open circuit voltage. Okay, so it's the potential that is uh, um, that is measured out of the battery terminals when the battery is at rest as a function of the uh, amount of charges stored in the electrodes. One thing that I want you to know this also is that uh, the LFP, which is uh, the green uh, um, curve here, has a pretty flat. Uh, 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 behavior, uh, as opposed to this uh, uh, almost linear, uh, nicely linear behavior that uh, you, on the other hand, you will see in the NMC and the CA. So that's a very important things to notice when you go ahead and uh, uh, create your BMS, because that will lead to, I wanted to kind of warn you, leads to observability issues and the ability to estimate accurately uh, state of charge. So, um, so one of the things we control uh, um, uh, battery system engineers will look at is also look at these uh, features and these signatures to understand our ability to do a good job in uh, estimating uh, um, uh, battery metrics. So um, I would say that <clears throat> I think in this, uh, we, we have, this audience have been exposed to lots of work, create great uh, research work related to battery cells. Uh, but I wanted to uh, kind of give you a breakout of what a battery packs look like. Um, so we start with uh, uh, cells. Cells can be come in the form of cylindrical or pouch or even prismatic. And, uh, and they're made of uh, anode, cathode, and separator. And the uh, cell then are um, put together, are assembled together uh, either in parallel or series configuration to create a module. And here is, a, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the, uh, an example of a, of a module. Uh, this is coming from uh, um, an electric vehicle. Whereas this is the uh, um, uh, 1865 cylindrical, cylindrical cells, there is a bunch of cells in, this, in these modules. Um, so modules are put then together to create a battery pack. And the battery pack needs to be equipped also with a BMS, which is this red box here. And, and then you can put more battery packs together to create a battery system, for example, for an electric bus or grid storage solution. One thing to notice here, as you also uh, um, have, uh, probably know, is that there is no standards in battery pack design. There is no standard in uh, um, necessarily in uh, uh, cell selection, and there is no standard in module design. We, you know, each battery pack use different module configurations. And that uh, makes it difficult, more difficult for using and recycling activities uh, later on. So this is probably something that we can work on all together to create some uh, uh, standards to uh, improve uh, um, and then it's uh, um, stronger, more robust circular economy. So let me go into BMS. What does the BMS uh, uh, do, what it is, and uh, what is uh, what are the information that we give to the BMS to operate uh, uh, properly? So let me tell you that the BMS can only rely on very few measurements, which are current voltage and temperature. And the temperature is uh, um, provided from a discrete, very optimized uh, um, uh, temperature sensors, which are uh, all over the battery pack. Current and, uh, current and voltage sensor are more local. Uh, but, uh, um, and for example, in a series configurations, you can uh, have a voltage sensor in each cell. Uh, in a, a parallel configuration of, 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 of cell, you have one voltage sensor to measure the, the voltage of the parallel. So, uh, um, so there are, um, uh, this type of uh, uh, measurements that uh, um, we can uh, use to um, to create uh, uh, functions which uh, should make and uh, uh, battery pack uh, uh, safe uh, by um, avoiding the, uh, the the battery to be overcharged or discharged overheated. 
Um, at the same time, uh, while we prevent, uh, uh, through the safety operating area, we prevent the, uh, the battery to operate in unsafe uh, regions, we want to uh, get the most of the performance of this, uh, of this battery. So uh, that basically uh, goes into controlling the uh, set of charge windows of operation, uh, what is controlling the charge current, uh, making sure the balance is done properly, um, and then uh, um, diagnostic and then health monitoring is very important to guarantee safety as well. So estimating state of health, uh, whatever state of health definition we want to give it to, and I'll go, uh, I will cover that later. And then also communication, that the BMS needs to communicate with the uh, AC chargers, for example, it needs to communicate with the, with the driver and other uh, ECUs uh, within the vehicles. And again, we are very demanding when it comes to uh, BMS functions, although we give it very, very little. And that's why, as I say earlier, there is a lot of engineering around it. So um, two main uh, problems we have uh, in, uh, uh, in electric vehicles is that when you drive it, you need to know, you need to be aware of, aware of how many miles you can still drive. And that does not come uh, from direct uh, sensor information. There's no sensor that tells you exactly how much charge is left. You need to estimate it. And so the state of charge estimation problem is about uh, uh, giving the best uh, information uh, that, uh, uh, possible about uh, how many miles you can drive. Um, at the same time, another problem that uh, um, you need to face now with electric vehicles is the ability to uh, do diagnostics and uh, estimate health. And so uh, health is related to the amount of usable life that the battery has left. And there are tricks that are uh, being implemented in today's batteries to make sure that this health is uh, um, uh, improved. And so battery is oversized, so you can rely on the extra range of uh, energy that you don't use at the beginning of life to release it later through some uh, 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 update of the software. And, uh, uh, but uh, um, that will last, uh, you know, uh, just uh, as much at some point you will see the, uh, the gritting performance of your battery. At that point, uh, you might need to, um, you know, um, sell or, or return, the, return the vehicle. But this is the oversize of the battery is, uh, uh, is uh, for example, design and engineer to make the driver have a good experience driving the vehicle for eight to eight, 10 years. Now, those two quantities, as I said, are not measurable. Um, and so uh, on, the, on the other hand, they're very, very important. So uh, what we do is to uh, create uh, uh, models and uh, uh, equip them with control and monitor algorithms to address these two, uh, these two very important uh, um, uh, questions. We have a holistic approach when it comes to BMS design. I'm going to go quickly because I, I don't want to take too much of my time, but um, we really take this from uh, um, start to finish. And so we do experimental testing. We collect experimental data of, of different uh, uh, cells. We create a model and we have a, um, white um, quite wide spectrum models we uh, create in, uh, in our lab. Uh, we have many libraries uh, spanning from electrochemical ES to equivalent circuit models. And uh, um, we uh, tackle identification um, challenges and uh, uh, to parameterize those models accurately, which we then use for uh, uh, model-based um, estimation, especially uh, related to state of charge and state of health. Uh, there is some aside work we do for uh, temperature estimation as well. Now, this is done at the cell level. And, uh, and then, uh, um, because as I say, the battery pack is the interconnection of cells in series and parallel, we look at uh, uh, creating high fidelity models for uh, battery pack um, uh, simulations where we interconnect, basically we, um, um, uh, integrate electrochemical thermal aging dynamics in a proper fashion. And then we use this uh, uh, framework, this modeling framework to develop control strategies, which I'm going to talk later. And then uh, lastly, we 
uh, uh, we are very much interested in the feasibility of our algorithms for real time uh, application, for real time deployment. So we do battery in the loop, AR doing the loop validation. So um, our work is really about uh, in, in using uh, uh, tools at the intersection of electrochemistry, model-based control, data-driven method, and experiments. And I'm, I would like to, uh, if time uh, allows, I would like to go over three main applications that I picked for today's presentation. And one is the electrochemical uh, state of charge, state of health observer design. Uh, we um, also look at some machine learning-based state of health estimation and then uh, optimization for a uh, laugh extension, but the laugh extension uh, done at the packet, uh, battery pack level. So um, there are many uh, models available out there. And when it comes to design a BMS, the very first question you need to ask yourself, which model should I use? Um, models can uh, vary in complexity and, uh, and of course also in uh, accuracy, going from atomistic down to empirical models. In today's BMS, empirical models are the uh, um, tools used. Um, and uh, uh, whereas for design, uh, this model here, this class of models are also, uh, on the other hand, they've been used. And I have to say the state of the art is also in today's modeling is to use uh, uh, machine learning uh, information um, to, to equip those, uh, those models. Now, um, the difference, uh, uh, the main difference between the ECM and the uh, so equivalent circuit models, electrochemical models are in the fact that these are very easy to run in real time, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, from a computational standpoint, standpoint you have a, a Two or three ODEs, ordinary differential equations that you have to um, that you have to solve. The main disadvantage of this equivalent circuit model is that they don't uh, embed um, information about uh, health or aging or any physics whatsoever, uh, and they also require a quite extensive uh, uh, calibration effort that. Uh, um, um, requires a lot of a lot of experiments. You cannot extrapolate the behavior of uh, ECM outside the condition over which the, the, the model has been uh, calibrated. Electrochemical models, on the other hand, retain uh, the physics of, of the battery. And so uh, as such, they require a much uh, um, smaller set of calibration uh, experimental data to be calibrated. Uh, their behavior uh, is, uh, you know, uh, physically um, is retained. Uh, they retain the physics, and as such, they can allow some sort of, you know, to some extent, some extrapolation. So, uh, what we're doing in our lab is to uh, kind of uh, um, um, challenge the status quo, and we abandon the use of equivalent circuit model for a state of charge and state of health. Uh, real-time uh, estimation, and we embrace the, uh, the richness of electrochemical models for uh, the development of those observer. Um, so the, uh, there are a few electrochemical models out there. Uh, the most uh, uh, common um, use, commonly used is the uh, Doyle, Fuller, and Newman model. Um, this is the more complete electrochemical models that uh, relies on mass uh, conservation in the solid electrolyte phase and charge conservation in the electrolyte uh, in the solid phase. Uh, there is an assumption made there, which is that the, the, the particles are spherical, which is kind of uh, a good approximation for certain chemistry like NMC, but it's not a good approximation for LFP, which on the, on the other hand, have a more squarish type of um, particle shape. Uh, we can uh, simplify the complexity of this uh, the DFN model by uh, neglecting the charge conservation in the solid phase. And, uh, and within this framework, we assume that the particle is spherical. There's only one particle in each electrode. And, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and the electrolyte has its own dynamics. So we uh, model the charge conservation in the electrolyte phase. Uh, going uh, um, down to the spectrum here, uh, the single particle model uh, make the assumption that uh, um, uh, the electrolyte dynamics do not uh, uh, do not change, and so they are uh, 
basically uh, all we care about here is the mass conservation, the solid phase. This is a good approximation if your system is operating on low C rate. And so SPM and DSPM, they perform very, very similarly, uh, basically in the same manner uh, when the C rate is below, for example, 3C or so. And it is a good approximation to this battery. Battery packs are getting bigger and bigger. So for grid storage, I would say that uh, SPM is uh, uh, perfectly uh, valid electrochemical models to use if you want to do some uh, in-depth um, uh, study. So, um, I want to say that the key uh, to apply our observer design is to uh, translate the uh, knowledge coming from the governing equation, the mathematical expression of the governing equation into uh, the state space model. So ESPM or SPM or DFN comes in the form of partial differential equations. And uh, uh, when it comes to um, create control algorithms, what in reality you, you, you want, you would like to have is a system um, that is expressed in the form of ordinary differential, um, differential equations. And so, um, so by, by doing discretization in the solid particles in the electrolyte uh, direction, we can uh, now translate uh, PD model into OD model. And uh, the input, so the control input of this model is current and the voltage is the output that we measure. So we have access to voltage sensors. And the output, um, uh, the cell voltage is a function, is expressed as a function of the over potential, the um, open circuit potential, and the uh, electrolyte resistance, and the, um, and the, and the battery current as well. Now, um, an important step is parameter identifiability. Uh, what my student uh, Anirudh uh, did as part of his dissertation is to develop uh, some new routines to tackle the identifiability problem. And uh, those, those models can come with a, a big set of parameters, like large set, like 20 or, or even higher um, set of parameters. And, uh, um, and sometimes it's difficult to really get a handle of uh, what what's truth in the value, numerical values, those parameters with uh, which we try to identify, if you try to identify all of them at once. So what we did is to develop this routine that relies on local sensitivity, correlation analysis, and uh, equipped with additional cost function. Additional cost functions, what they do, just to give you an idea, to, to impose new constraints. And uh, those additional cost functions uh, uh, comes from adding virtual measurements in the uh, multi-objective optimization problem that is formulated to, um, to carry out the parameter identifiability. Um, details are in this paper if you're interested. And so uh, the, um, the identification results and validation results show good, uh, um, good uh, RMS uh, performance. And so once you have a good, uh, a good model in your hand, you can go ahead and uh, uh, try to uh, apply um, uh, some of the control algorithm to do um, the estimation you need to do. Now, there are a few things that I wanted to walk through to make you understand why you really need to go into electrochemical models and why we cannot do something more um, like uh, simplistic. So the status quo is a, a column counting method. Um, so it's a very simple, simplistic model. And what it does is basically uh, take the current that we measure from sensors and integrate the current uh, uh, in this fashion and, uh, uh, and to, to get this set of charge. So this charge is this dimensional quantity, um, which is normalized with respect to the maximum charge that you can, uh, uh, that the battery can, uh, can, uh, can store. Uh, there are three main problems with this uh, with this model. First of all, you need to know the initial condition. Anytime you do an integration, you implement an integration uh, operation. You need to know where to start from. Otherwise, your uh, your final result is going to be um, you know shifted or biased. And sometimes this is not uh, an information that we have. And going back to what I was mentioning earlier on the LFP battery that has a very flat uh, OCV. 
Um, so state of charge and OCV, they are uh, correlated. And so one, thing, one way to look at initial state of charge is by inverting OCV map. And that can be done only when the battery has been at rest for uh, some period of time. Now, if you have an LFP and you have this flatness, you'll see that uh, inverting the OCV uh, to get information about uh, um, SOC will give you a wide range of value. So, uh, even, uh, the, even if the battery has been arrested for a long period of time, you might not be able to get the initial condition accurately. And so this method might lead to, this method based on column counting might lead to big errors. Another problem is the fact that you are integrating a signal a current that is affected by uh, noise. And so um, eventually, ultimately, you will have some drift there. And uh, lastly, you're dividing this by a quantity that changes over time. Q is this, uh, um, for most is the um, feature that indicates state of health. It's not the only one, but it, it does uh, uh, decreases as the battery ages. And so if you do not, um, this quantity accurately, uh, you, you are in trouble. So you will get a very off estimation or calculation of the state of charge. And so uh, there is a very hard dark solution that is implemented and used today on, on vehicles or in BMS, which is um, people use a second order equivalent circuit model, uh, parameterized, uh, um, properly parameterized, and they use the column counting method and then look up tables to have information about capacity and to, um, to basically uh, return uh, um, estimation of state of charge and state of health. What we wanna do on the other hand is to really uh, take all of that out and reformulate and re, um, basically bring new uh, ideas into the, uh, this problem. And uh, SPM, so single particle models equipped new control uh, solutions is the, uh, the, the solution we are proposing. So, and that's what we're gonna uh, uh, quickly, quickly see. Because this audience is not, uh, probably has not been exposed to estimation and observer design problems, I wanted to give you very quick uh, um, uh, points and knowledge about estimation problems. So whenever you have an, a, a um, dynamical system, uh, for example, battery can be any, anything else that dynamically changes upon being excited uh, from an input and uh, uh, relying on certain um, uh, measurements. So uh, if you have a dynamical system and you know uh, its inputs and its outputs and you want to access the internal states, so what you're trying to do is to, um, 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 and those states are not measurable. What you're trying to do is to ask yourself, can I, can I uh, build or design a model-based observer? Can I have access to the internal states from only information of what I see outside the system itself? And so uh, a model-based observer is nothing but a mathematical copy of the system. And so because of this is a mathematical copy of the system, you understand why we, we are making so much um, you know, we're putting so much effort in defining and the selecting the right models for the, and that is, you know, for the ultimate goal of designing the observer. Um, and so, uh, so you can uh, eventually um, be able to uh, estimate those internal states by building this model-based observer. Now, um, the, uh, there is some fundamental question you have to ask yourself before you can build the uh, model-based observer. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the way a model-based observer, a closed loop model-based observer works is by you know, copy, um, creating a copy of the mathematical dynamics of the system and uh, injecting the input, the current and the voltage of the system uh, of the measure voltage into the observer and uh, uh, extracted an estimated uh, uh, voltage response and estimated uh, um, uh, state vector. Now this mechanism works, so the estimate x hat converge eventually to the real state that you have in the system that you cannot measure because we use a feedback mechanism that relies on comparing the real measurement y voltage with the estimated one. So this error is fed back to the observer and it gets corrected through the gains used in the observer to lead to uh, the real estimates. Now, the very first question that you need to ask yourself before you go ahead and build this observer is, uh, can I even build the observer? Is the system observable? 
from the input output. Can I get access to the internal states by only those two measurements? So there are uh, these questions is answered by uh, using nonlinear observability tools. Um, and I'm not gonna uh, go into the theory, but I wanted to uh, just uh, um, explain what the difficulty uh, is here. So you have a battery to two electrodes and those two electrodes can be seen or interpreted as two buckets, which are, uh, you know, can be filled and empty as the battery uh, gets charged and discharged. And uh, what we do, we measure the difference Okay, so the voltage measurement uh, that we make at the terminal of the battery is the difference of uh, the uh, open circuit potential at the cathode uh, minus the open circuit potential at the, at the anode. And so you, you understand that there might be for one measurement, there might be many combinations of UP and UN uh, that uh, um, you know, are gonna be uh, matching that measurement itself. And so that's one big, you know, one of the main problems. The other problem comes from the fact that uh, the open circuit potential, for example, in this case of the graphite is pretty flat. And so there is some uncertainty there in understanding what the real value of one is, if you, if you know the uh, theta n. So that's the observability issue that we have to deal with every day when we build the observer for batteries. And so, um, so we can estimate the potential difference between two electrodes, but we cannot estimate individual electro potentials nor the uh, lithium ion concentration. Um, we, we've done some studies uh, and uh, uh, we have shown that observability of uh, uh, single particle models is a, is a function and depends on the uh, current amplitude and the current uh, um, dynamics. Uh, and that's because the current uh, gets into the Lie bracket uh, formulation of the observability matrix. But we also have, uh, have shown that uh, observability depends on the battery chemistry. Okay, uh, when it comes to uh, use the OCV um, uh, to get information about the um, uh, concentration. So having said that, uh, I wanted to um, make the point that a closed loop observer as the generally traditionally, um, you know, uh, design cannot be used for this, uh, for this system, for exact that problem that I showed in the previous slides. So we had to create a new framework, a new idea and uh, uh, that will tackle that challenge. And so um, the idea here is to use an electro-based internet connected observer. And uh, what this is about, just to uh, give you uh, the main uh, um, idea behind this uh, uh, new, um, new design is that we create two parallel uh, observer that work uh, uh, separately on each electrode. So we have a cathode observer that we build that is based on closed loop cathode and open loop anode uh, estimation. And, uh, and at the same time in parallel, we have an anode observer. Um, what I wanted to uh, also um, stress is that whenever you have an open loop uh, anode, whenever you have an open loop observer, uh, the estimation from the open loop observer is as accurate as initial conditions. So in order for us to really rely on this open loop uh, uh, estimator, we need to make sure that the in initial condition, for example, of the anode concentration used here in the cathode observer is the correct one. And so, um, and that is fed back from the anode observer and the same for the open loop cathode, uh, the initial condition of the concentration of lithium using this observer comes from the cathode observer. In this way, the two uh, observers help each other and uh, uh, the lead to uh, convergence of the uh, estimated states with respect to the real estate. Now, um, one other point that is very important to keep in mind is that whenever you look at the observability opportunities uh, uh, within your system, you might, um, you might have uh, the successful answer that yes, your system is observable when you look at the observability matrix, which is full rank. On the other hand, uh, you might be leading, uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, poor condition number. So condition number is, uh, uh, is a matrix, a feature that tells you how poor the estimates can be from uh, whenever you're trying to uh, design an observer. And so one thing that I wanted to stress here is that with this uh, interconnected uh, electrode based observer, we improve the condition number by an order of magnitude of five with respect to a traditional observer for both electrodes. 
So here are some uh, simulations uh, that shows that even if you initialize your concentration in the bulk concentration of lithium in the uh, uh, positive and negative electrode uh, incorrectly, you, you converge. So behind the, uh, this framework, there is some uh, rigorous uh, Lyapunov-based uh, uh, proofs. Uh, that uh, uh, guarantee the convergence of the estimated states to internal uh, to the real state. So some takeaways from this study um, are the following. So first of all, nonlinearities matter. We need to acknowledge and keep those linearities when it comes to build and design the observer. Uh, and that's because the observability is really uh, affected by, by it. Uh, battery chemistry, type of chemistry and the technology you use can affect observability properties. And so that needs to be taken into account in your design. And uh, the electrobaser structure overcome observability issues. And, uh, um, and uh, behind this, uh, um, uh, and beyond this uh, 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 design, there is a rigorous proof of convergence that guarantee that the fact the estimates converge to the, um, to the real uh, internal states. Uh, I would like to check uh, uh, with E about time. I have some more slides to show. Um, Simona, you, you probably will need to uh, wrap it up soon, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, let, me, let me just uh, go quickly over um, the extension of this observer to estimate health. Um, the battery, uh, as the battery ages, the parameters of the model use change as well. So if you're trying to use that estimator that I show for an aged battery, uh, what happens is that there is no convergence. You will see that the concentration of lithium, in this case, uh, uh, surface concentration does uh, uh, something completely different from uh, uh, the real one. And so what you need to do is to really make some changes to that framework and equip with some adaptation mechanism. You need to be able to adapt some key parameters that change with aging uh, that will infer that will basically uh, advise your system um, about what's uh, what's going on. So adaptation laws are used in this framework to um, uh, um, basically inform the single particle models in the observer design that uh, uh, aging is happening and so there is, not, there is some update to be done. Let me tell you that as far as aging and I want to uh, just use this slide as a, a final point for my talk. So uh, we're dealing with fresh cell in this case. And, uh, and so uh, what the community agrees with is that solid electrolyte interface is the main AG mechanism that happens at the anode at the uh, negative electrode um, as the battery is, uh, is, is being used in, in, uh, in, in whatever application. Now, this uh, uh, growth in the uh, solid electrolyte interface layer um, is observed uh, uh, through some capacity fade and power fade. Now, uh, and what that means is that in our model, the parameters change, uh, will change with age and they won't be constant, so it needs to be updated. And as this SCI layer grows, um, what you will see is a, um, is a decrease in cell capacity. So cell capacity decreases, but that's not the only thing that happens. And so what we look at, what do we uh, incorporate in our uh, model is uh, uh, also uh, an update of electrochemical parameters like porosity. Porosity decreases. Uh, that, uh, that lead to power fade. The solid phase diffusivity uh, um, in the anode also decreases. Uh, transport parameters in the electrolyte also uh, undergo uh, some uh, um, decrease in trend. So uh, ion conductivity and diffusivity in the electrolyte. And then uh, at the same time, the ion conductivity in the SCI uh, uh, decreases as the lithium uh, go basically uh, has to go through the SCI layers. And also the electrostoichiometry um, uh, values will undergo some changes. So all of those uh, uh, changes in the electrochem electrochemical parameters lead to an increase of electrolyte resistance and also an increase of uh, SCI layer resistance. 
and uh, which uh, lead uh, to power fade as well. So one thing that we did in our work and, uh, um, and what my student did, Aniru did, was to uh, create a new functional relationship to, uh, to connect to link capacity fade to power with power fade through these electrochemical uh, parameter changes. Um, so the observer I showed earlier is uh, basically improved and is uh, uh, reformulated uh, by adding now some adaptation uh, mechanism in the form of uh, anode diffusion coefficient uh, in the anode observer and the SLA ion conductivity in the cathode observer. And, uh, um, and, uh, um, and so not only now we can uh, estimate lithium ion concentration in both electrodes and therefore also infer cell capacity and the power fade. Uh, and uh, uh, we can also track changes in those uh, parameters as well. I would like to conclude with this uh, uh, simulation results uh, quickly uh, that shows that even if the observer is wrongly initialized, there is convergence of, uh, of the estimated capacity within a very small percentage uh, within the uh, real one. And uh, we, we did some robustness uh, um, uh, validation. We inject uh, uh, noise in the current and voltage and test the, the observer. The observer, one way, one way to think of our observer is a low pass filter. So uh, naturally filters out uh, noise and also it's, it's shown to be robust against uh, um, uh, constant biases in the voltage and current. And lastly, we did the battery in the loop implementation. We connect the, uh, ultimately we want to really test this uh, algorithm in real time. We test the battery, we connect the battery to a DC load and through communication, can communication, uh, uh, we basically uh, um, we, we flash the algorithm in the macro out of box, the space uh, uh, ECU um, electronic units, and, uh, um, and this is a real time embedded system. And then we, we look at and we monitor uh, the uh, the state of uh, uh, the state of health of the of the system itself. That's the uh, layout in our battery in our battery lab, and uh, um, and these are uh, simulation results from our um, battery in the loop simulations. And uh, the the battery capacity converges and is within uh, two percent error uh, from the real value. And with that, uh, I wanted to just uh, um, really finish this uh, uh, talk with some takeaways. Um, we, in this work, we address uh, um, uh, quite deeply the problem of observability and the feasibility of uh, um, classical observer design when it comes to estimating acid of charge and acid of health. Uh, we believe that electrochemistry equipped with control theory and, uh, uh, and rely on experimental uh, um, uh, data uh, constitute the state of the art of uh, this type of uh, BMS uh, features. Uh, we, we have proposed rigorous proof of convergence of the estimated state energy parameters. And, uh, and, and as I was, saying in, in, I was saying initially, this is done for a fresh battery. Well, when it comes to have a reused battery, for example, that we get out of the retired uh, EVs, uh, there are other edgy mechanisms that uh, uh, come into play in place and those edgy mechanisms interact each other in a non-linear and uh, unpredictable fashion. So one thing that we would like to do here is to add degradation, additional degradation mechanism and use also machine learning to get insight about uh, um, how to rationalize those uh, edgy mechanism from data. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, in the later on, we'll, one important things to do is to uh, test this algorithm on real data, field data. To, uh, to test the effect, uh, um, effective robustness. And, uh, and the other challenge that we're working on is the efficient deployment of this algorithm, a large scale battery pack. So where we have hundreds of thousands of cells. So we thank, thank you here for your patience. And so yeah, thank you, Simona. Uh, maybe Simona will just take one question for the time consideration. Um, you're describing this electrochemical uh, based model instead of circuit model. I think one question coming from audience is uh, uh, how much uh, computing power is necessary to 
to do so, right? I mean, how fast can it done? Can it be done? I would say in the realistic sense in the BMS, you know, on board in the electric car. Right, right. So that, that's a very important question, right? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. Can we run in the real time? So uh, there are more um, one PD. If you use a, a single particle model, you use uh, the um, uh, charge conservation or in the electrode, in the solid phase, you have one partial differential equation, one per each electrode. And if you go ahead and discretize that, you might end up with uh, maybe five ODEs for each electrode of maybe four. Um, so in ECM, you have two or three uh, ordinary differential equations. So you have a slightly higher number of ODEs. Yet what we have shown in the hardware in, in our lab is that you can really run the electrochemical models in real time. So that hasn't been done on real vehicles and that's our next uh, uh, step. We really wanna uh, prove that we can do it in a real vehicle. But in our mind, that's our uh, next step, um, in the very next things to do. Now, uh, that being said, we also need to acknowledge the fact that today we can rely on cloud computing. So we don't have to think about those algorithms to necessarily be run in real time on our ECU and the vehicle. They can be run through cloud computing and be used uh, in, in, with, that, with that platform. So probably that's the application, the, the very uh, ultimate application that we are looking at. If we don't want to sacrifice the uh, accuracy of, uh, of these models. Yeah, thank you, Simona. Thank uh, you. I'll, I'll pass this back to Will. All right. Uh, thank you, E, and thank you, Simona, for that very extensive talk. Uh, so now um, we have our second speaker uh, for today, uh, Professor Dirk Uwer Zauer from the University of Aachen. So let me briefly uh, introduce um, Dirk Uwer. He is currently the chair of the Electrochemical Energy Conversion and Storage Systems. And like Simona, he is a true uh, engineer, an electrochemical engineer. And his work really reflects this uh, intersection of science and engineering. I want to highlight um, that Dirk Ruver is also a beacon of inspiration internationally for academia, national lab, and industry collaboration. Uh, he's, at, um, he's a leader, for example, directing uh, the Ulish Aachen Research Alliance and also uh, in the leadership of the Helmholtz Institute Münster uh, Network as well. And uh, at least to us in the US, uh, this is very inspiring to see how national labs and academia and industry are coming together. Uh, I know that Dirk Uwer also operates a very large um, uh, experimental facility that welcomes uh, industry users as well. Um, in addition to his role um, in developing industry, academia, and national lab collaboration, he's also a community leader. He is the editor of the journal of energy storage that uh, publishes many important articles uh, in the field of electrochemical engineering. And then finally, I also wanna highlight that Doug Ruver is also a proponent um, and practitioner of technology transfer. I know that he is also has a number of entrepreneurial activities and also support uh, his um, mentees on translating technology outside of the lab. So uh, as you can see from my introduction, uh, he is really uh, influencing the field and the community in a multitude of ways, academically, and, but also uh, industrially as well. So Doug Hoover, we're very excited to hear your thoughts on how this is all coming together and uh, sharing your learnings with that. Doug Hoover, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, you know, many, many thanks for the very kind introduction. And uh, it's really a great, uh, pleasure for me and a great honor to uh, have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, not easy after this um, very broad and uh, also deep dive of uh, Simona into all the things in uh, um, battery diagnostics and modeling, but uh, yeah, we will see that for sure. And uh, I think this is also good news, uh, motivation, and uh, but also problems and approaches are um, relatively similar um, around uh, the world. Probably we're looking a little bit from a different perspective uh, on this as William already has uh, mentioned. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to share slides with me. I hope this uh, works now. Um, yeah, so um, as said, uh, I'm coming from the RWTH Aachen University. This is a um, large uh, engineering research university with about 47,000 students in bachelor and master courses. 
and um, was uh, very much dedicated also in research towards uh, cooperation with the industry. This of course was already mentioned. So we always try to find the balance between basic research, but also transfer of results uh, into um, applications. Uh, would shortly introduce uh, what, uh, what we are doing. So um, here we have the two chairs. Uh, Professor Eckhard Fiegemeier is with us uh, since some years. Um, and uh, we are looking into these fields uh, of uh, battery analytics uh, and um, to materials, to modeling, lifetime prediction, and then battery systems and vehicle integration, including all these diagnostics and battery uh, management systems. And um, uh, finally, also the uh, grid integration um, issues. So we have about uh, 80 uh, full-time employees in our group and the uh, same number roughly in students doing the bachelor and master thesis or so working as student assistants um, with us. Um, structures of um, German chairs are somewhat different maybe to uh, those in the United um, States. So, um, we a little bit different uh, sized in terms of relation, for example, among um, professors and, uh, and, and, and students. But with a team, we can cover a wide range of uh, topics here in this field. And let me say approximately 80% traditionally of our projects are in cooperation with uh, industry, either via public funded projects. Uh, so we hardly get uh, public funded projects without industry collaborations. Uh, or by direct financing from the industry, so it was a direct uh, transfer. So what we are just uh, going for is uh, to extend our activities, especially into the field of these fields of aging, reliability, and lifetime prediction. So we understand ourselves as an intermediate uh, somehow between those who develop materials or production processes on the one hand, and those who integrate batteries into the fields. And this is uh, why we are doing these things from deep understanding of the materials. And we especially with our work, we want to accelerate the time to market. So when there are new materials or new cell designs or new production processes, um, it is our task, and uh, this is what we really want to achieve, to characterize um, these uh, materials and cells in a short time uh, so that we can uh, give feedback and accelerate at the end of the day the overall uh, development um, by fast, uh, much faster feedback as we have it today, let me say, from pure uh, benchmark tests. And this is why we combine electrochemical analysis um, down to the nanometer scale uh, modeling uh, along all the scales uh, from the uh, uh, things we just have seen from Simona up to the um, applications in cars or in European uh, electricity grids and uh, with the test benches. And in our new center, CAR, Center for Aging Reliability and Lifetime Prediction, um, we bring these things together and we uh, hope that we uh, will rush in here in the um, end of May this, um, this year. Um, here we have about 5,000 square meters of the lab space and office space and uh, for space for about 150 researchers. And uh, as I said, on the one hand, so we really can look in deep into the materials uh, also in situ in the battery cells, so on different um, size levels. And on the other hand, we also can put a full car into a temperature chamber. Uh, we have vibration shock um, facilities uh, there, salty fog for environmental conditions. Um, and, and this is very special. We have uh, the uh, third chair here um, by Professor de Donker. Um, and um, he's doing the electronics. Uh, so uh, we can combine also the look to the battery, uh, to the chemistry and uh, to all the electronic components, uh, the battery management systems for sure from the hardware side, but also from the power electronics to see where we can find best um, overall system solutions, not just uh, limited to certain thing. Very important is here uh, that we have a lot of test benches. Um, we will operate here more than um, 4,000 uh, test benches 
with currents uh, starting from 20 amps uh, to uh, roughly 500 amps for different test benches. Uh, for sure, the majority is, um, is in the range of these 20 amps um, for the smaller cells. But uh, we really want to go into statistical analysis and also, for example, if a, um, if a production line is put into operation, we will be able to collect maybe every day 10 cells, have a semi-automatic analysis uh, of these uh, cells and put them for up to half a year into aging tests uh, and this day by day. Uh, so to really monitor how the process um, are improved or if some things are going into the wrong direction and to give this a fast feedback loop. And um, yeah, this is somehow how we represent this. So at the end of the day, um, we want to bring all the things, so we bring the things together to understand what happens if somebody accelerates a car, what does it mean for the current distribution within, that, within the cells and the battery pack, what does it mean to the distribution of currents in electrodes uh, to concentration of ions and then down to what does it means to ion concentration in, in crystals and particles and so on. So to really understand what it does it mean, especially for sure with regard to uh, aging uh, when somebody accelerates a car but also the other way around. Yeah, so if we have a new material, some, some uh, colleagues come with a set of uh, with new materials where we want to try to um, uh, characterize them in a way that we can tell them relatively early uh, if the material they are just developing will be a benefit for a certain application or if um, maybe the existing technologies already cover all what the new material can. So back and forth uh, in, in this uh, circle of innovation, this is um, our task here. And this is all comes along for sure with a lots of data collection, data management, analysis, machine learning, and, uh, and so on. And as already mentioned, we are currently have uh, four active spin-off companies uh, who um, were uh, founded uh, by our former um, PhD students in the field of um, testing, modeling, diagnostics. So this company works for all the uh, European-based uh, car manufacturers in the uh, battery testing, for example, but also develop or um, supplying of models and diagnostic uh, tools and consultancy. Uh, EBUS plan is um, supporting um, um, public transport authorities or transport authorities in introducing uh, electric buses. Um, Safion is doing diagnostics, uh, so rapid diagnostics uh, for battery management systems, but especially also for end of line um, testing in production, um, in battery production. And Acure is uh, looking into this uh, from a data point of view. So they are um, yeah, collecting uh, data and um, doing data analytics. So then for sure, this is a really cloud-based uh, approach and uh, um, they are collecting already today, uh, more less than two years after they were founded uh, from several 10,000 batteries uh, data from many different applications, including automotive, but also ships or bikes or uh, stationary storage systems. But before now, I would like to go into the, some details on um, modeling uh, and um, uh, control as, as, as well. Uh, please allow me to pause for at least for a minute. Uh, we just uh, are learning the hard uh, way um, how small our otherwise seemingly big everyday problems are. Um, but it's also time to reflect what and why we are doing what we do. Yeah? We have a war in Europe, and uh, this is uh, really uh, something which is um, yeah, extremely difficult for all of us. Uh, people are dying. Nevertheless, um, I think um, one of the big uh, issues, and uh, Simona also raised this uh, problem, the highly dependent on the the fossil fuels uh, from Russia, but also from other countries where we are not too happy to be dependent on, um, is uh, something we can defeat uh, with uh, going for renewable energies uh, for energy vendor. And uh, finally, for sure, energy storage, battery storage is a key technology um, to um, really introduce this. And um, yeah, this is main motivation for me since uh, 
I'm now roughly 30 years uh, working in this field of renewables and energy storage. So battery modeling and diagnostics, um, all the motivations and so on were shown greatly by Simona uh, already. Um, as we all know, batteries age also very differently. Yeah? So this is why we need highly adaptable algorithms um, if you look to the aging of uh, cars as here for the um, leaf, uh, we can see over time um, there is a very wide spread in aging, um, depending for sure on the operating conditions, but also, as we all know, there are hardly two really identical battery cells coming from the production. And, um, therefore, and this is uh, then uh, part of our uh, main part of our work, um, we would like to support uh, customers, uh, users um, um, to um, look into what they are really concerned of um, questions about range, safety, charging time, cost, but also residual values. So most important thing probably in the future will be to be able to uh, predict the remaining life of a battery at any, any point of time, because if you want to sell a used car, um, the main value of this used car will be the battery, and therefore this uh, residual, uh, residual value is here of uh, major uh, con concern. And um, the battery, the challenges uh, for sure also have been shown. Um, the cells are different from the manufacturing process, uh, sometimes very small differences in thickness of layers of internal pressures and so on already lead to significant changes, at least, let me say, in the last third of the lifetime of the batteries. This is what makes it so difficult. At, at the beginning of life, everything looks pretty similar, but not towards the end. Depth of discharge makes a difference, temperature, time, state of charge, the uh, currents, uh, and for also for sure, mechanical stress. And there's all results for sure in capacity fade and in power fade, and this is what the user really cares for. And um, questions are then um, coming from this, for example, how long will be the li uh, first life in a car? What is the residual value after the first life? How long could it work in a second life? For sure, depending on the operating conditions, uh, pretty much. Uh, how reliable will the battery in the second um, life? So how often will we um, have to face a sudden death of, of, of batteries or even maybe uh, things like a fire? And these things, lucky we are, do not happen too often, but they are happening. And uh, so we have to deal with this. And um, yeah, so questions also for sure, is there, what, what are the applications for something like second life or is there a second life at all? Something which uh, is really interesting to discuss, but maybe not um, part of uh, today's discussion here. So when we look to the battery, um, we um, have to have the uh, a deep understanding, and this for sure can be represented, what is today called a digital twin uh, of, of the battery. We all use these uh, terms. Um, so, and this for sure is based, based on uh, physics-based modeling um, in, in different ways. Uh, we have machine learning algorithms uh, for supervised learning and reinforced learning and uh, parameterizing models or making also predictions. And so we need data, we need field data uh, for all of this uh, to verify our models, but also to use them for sure as input into machine learning. And based on this, then we can do the diagnostics, the prognosis, and um, uh, also here the, uh, um, the optimization of all this. Uh, because at the end of the day, for sure, we would like to recommend uh, to those who build battery systems and those who operate it, um, what to do to have to achieve the longest lifetimes, either by designing the battery packs and maybe even the battery cells in the most proper way, but also how to adapt the operating st strategies uh, uh, properly to get uh, to the best what we can get uh, from the battery. So the full cycle control here was uh, the battery digital twin allows us in state monitoring parameter identification, aging estimation, capacity fade and power fade prediction. Also maximum power prediction is for sure an, an important uh, thing. 
uh, especially for example in hybrid uh, electric vehicles where power is uh, the, the most important thing and uh, the optimization of operating uh, strategies and uh, as shown before all these things have to come together and uh, this is what really is the great thing about battery research that is so much interdisciplinary um, and we need to really the specialists from the discipline, from all the different disciplines, from mathematics, from informatics, from me uh, mechanical engineering, from chemistry, from physics, and for sure also from electrical engineering here uh, to really get an understanding of um, these very complex device called a battery. So, and um, so this was already mentioned by Simona, especially in, in the answer to the question that at, at the end, uh, for sure, the opportunities we have today are significantly larger than maybe five, 10 years ago. Um, on the one hand, we have significantly more powerful um, computing, computational chips in the vehicles. Uh, so, um, I started working on that asset batteries and if you look to these smart sensors on that asset batteries um, there we had to fight for every line of code for every variable um, because the um, capacity the computing capacity for these very cheap sensors was so so small this has changed but in addition for sure we now have also the opportunity to transfer some of the things into the cloud and this is also part of our approach to take data from aging experiments, um, which uh, we do on test benches or in, on, from field uh, data. Um, and so we can then uh, treat them here um, and we can learn things uh, from these uh, data. And then we can exchange uh, information back into the controller in the car. And um, so um, this is uh, how we can close uh, this uh, loop at the end of the day, because for sure every vehicle then can send back their data, their experience back into the cloud and is available then for all of the others. So I think this is most important um, for sure. The cloud gives us more computing power, but I think the highest value really comes from having such a huge ex data set and experience available. Um, from so many different applications um, and uh, batteries uh, so that, um, for example, somehow an error occur or it, it, um, it, an error problem develops further step by step by cell going to higher or lower voltages. So um, the scheme is, is uh, the um, uh, the way how this happens uh, could be compared with what I have in my car I'm just looking at with uh, hundred thousands maybe of other batteries so where similar things uh, may have occurred. And I think this is uh, what uh, brings us uh, really forward. The biggest problem here, uh, to be honest, is uh, we hardly get access to the data from the car manufacturers. Um, at least the German or the European car manufacturers are not very cooperative in sharing their data from what they measure in cars uh, until now, but we are working on, on, on this. And then for sure we have the different ways for modeling as a basis uh, for the prediction, but uh, also for the diagnostics in the car. We have the physical based uh, or physical chemical based models based on Euler uh, Fuller Newman models. We have these equivalent circuit models and we have um, uh, neural networks uh, at the end of the day. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, for sure, the physical interpretability is highest with the physical chemical models, very important when we want to understand how to improve the materials or design of the cells. Um, the adaptability and self-learning ability for sure is highest with neural networks and uh, implementation complexity and resources is uh, lowest uh, for the equivalent to circuit diagrams. And the question for sure is uh, how can we combine the best of all to um, bring things forward in, in the field? And uh, I would like to go into two examples uh, here of our work. And the one is a physical chemical model based control for plating free fast charging. So you will see several of the things Simona just has uh, shown um, already. 
um, for sure it starts uh, to have a physical chemical battery model. And I think in this audience, uh, I just can go through this uh, without discussing the things really in deep. Um, we have to look into the uh, structure for sure and the porosity and so on the uh, mechanical data, but then for sure into the diffusion processes, uh, lithium diffusion migration and the electrolyte, but also for sure in the crystals, the charge transfer uh, reaction, uh, the diffusion in the particles uh, themselves. And uh, finally, we have a um, um, two-dimensional uh, model in this case here. Uh, we're operating also three-dimensional models uh, to understand, for example, how lithium is uh, diffusing uh, into um, a backside layer of, um, of an electrode or from the electrode overhang uh, back and forth uh, into the active material. So all these things would at the end of the day are responsible for um, improvements in capacity, which we often see during rest periods uh, in testing of batteries, for example, or even yeah, if the batteries just was laying around um, two weeks, uh, four weeks or longer, we suddenly have a significant different capacity. And this is not due to aging, but uh, due to activation or loss of uh, lithium into the um, overhangs or backside uh, uh, coatings of uh, electrodes. So all this needs to be taken into account for the um, um, uh, models which we are operating directly in diagnostics uh, or in battery management systems. They are for sure more reduced order models. But uh, important also as seen before is uh, now to have the model on the one hand and uh, an observer for sure to update uh, the model and the parameters at any point of time. It is clear uh, a model without a parameter adaptation wouldn't help uh, at all for what we are doing. So the observation and updating is important. And then for sure, what the thing what we can do with this is uh, really adding a controller. And um, in the example now of, um, of charging, um, it is um, the relevant parameter for us uh, from this model is for sure the potential of the anode of the negative electrode. Um, we all know that the potential for sure has to stay above zero volts uh, with reference to the lithium lithium ion reference electrode, because otherwise we get this process of um, lithium plating, so deposition of metallic lithium, which uh, indeed um, results in very fast uh, aging. So, and this is what we have uh, done here. We uh, developed the model and so uh, we implemented it here on the battery management system platform. And uh, we uh, brought this uh, into our uh, test bench. Uh, so um, the model is running on this uh, battery management system platform, delivers the value for um, of the maximum current which can be applied to the battery without uh, going into plating, but for sure always to deliver the, or to take the maximum possible current to have the charging process as short as possible. And uh, this is connected then with a, a battery test bench and uh, the battery test bench is then um, connected to, to the battery it, uh, itself. And um, we have for sure bi-directional communication necessarily uh, because the data from the battery cell are going back into the battery management uh, system. And here you can see um, such a charging uh, process on the um, upper right hand, uh, in the upper right hand figure, you can see the current which is uh, flowing here. So it's an eight, uh, above, uh, approximately eight ampere hour battery cell. And you can see at the beginning, it can be charged at relatively high current, but uh, then towards the uh, full charging for sure was decreasing uh, current. This is the cell voltage. This is what we can measure with a battery management system without any problem, but which obviously does not hold the information we need because the information we need is this potential of the uh, negative uh, electrode. And here you can see we have uh, put the control value to five millivolt above zero. Um, and um, the controller um, keeps uh, the voltage of the anode according to the model output for sure, um, quite precisely uh, at these five millivolts just at the beginning 
um, it's a little bit fluctuating here. Temperature for sure has to be measured and taken into account here uh, as, as uh, well. So, and uh, this is then what we what we checked uh, if this has a positive effect on the batteries or not. Um, uh, looking to the batteries, uh, we, we check if uh, plating has happened by looking to the voltage during the um, following discharge. Yeah? So the battery is after the charging for sure discharged and from looking to the voltage or to the deep analysis of the voltage curve, um, we can see if there was uh, lithium deposited, metallic lithium, and um, we can see um, this as an example uh, here. Um, this is the um, uh, standard curve here we applied. Um, and uh, if we increase uh, the current rate by 10% or by 20%, we can see that the curves are, are obviously changing. And this is a clear indication that uh, we are, have the battery for a longer period of time on the lithium potential. And um, therefore, uh, this is an indication for having the uh, metallic lithium here uh, available. And the dotted line here is a constant current um, uh, charging in addition. And now the question is, uh, does it have an impact on the, on the battery? And even though these are just 35 uh, cycles, we can see that um, if we go with a constant current charging, so without control by our algorithms from the battery management system, we have a capacity decrease following this dotted line here. Um, a test has been done by zero degrees C. And if we control the, um, uh, the voltage according to what I just have shown, um, the aging is uh, significantly uh, lower because we can avoid um, the, um, the plating and not shown here. Uh, still, we were faster in recharging the battery with a controlled, in a controlled way, and we saved a uh, lot of time. And this is for sure exactly what the car manufacturer is now looking for. Yeah? So this is the biggest uh, question we face at the moment and also in cooperations with the automotive industry because I all want to have the cars charged with 200, 300, 350 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt power. And um, the question is how to do this without uh, harming the battery here dramatically. So and then the second um, 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 example I would like to discuss, uh, I'm looking to the physical chemicals from the parametrization uh, point of view. Um, you, know, you know that these uh, models we just have seen also with Simona and say, I have just shown, um, they have a huge number of, uh, of parameters and uh, the first challenge is for sure to understand which of these parameters really have an impact. So where we have a sensitivity on, on this or not. And um, yeah, here uh, are several of these parameters uh, listed uh, here, which are necessary to describe a battery cell. And within the last 10 years, we have developed uh, um, laboratory experiments uh, to determine each of these parameters for any, any battery we get into the lab. Yeah? So any type of uh, commercial battery cell or um, also um, batteries coming from research projects. Um, when they come in our lab, uh, we um, dismantle them uh, and uh, then we have uh, measurement procedures to determine the parameters of these models. Should it be porosity or diffusion or um, conductivities and, and whatever. And different, different um, procedures are used here and uh, at the end of the day, the question um, is, uh, can we do this also in a different way to determine these uh, parameters, at least if we have a battery cell operating? And this brings us to the question, uh, to what extent uh, we can also determine these parameters from machine learning or artificial uh, in intelligence. And uh, for this, uh, as uh, also shown by Simona, it is necessary to look into the sensitivity analysis so we apply, for example, VLTP driving cycles uh, to electric models. And uh, from this, we generate battery current uh, profiles in a huge number under many different conditions for different uh, batteries, different chemistries, and so on, um, to see at the end of the day, which of the parameters uh, are really highly sensitive 
and uh, which of them has a little sensitivity because obviously when we want to have uh, self-learning models uh, running in the car, we cannot learn 30 or 35 parameters just from measuring the current voltage and temperature, maybe impedance in, it, in addition. So we have to concentrate on those parameters which really have a high uh, sensitivity um, towards um, the um, lifetime issues uh, we're really looking uh, for. And um, when, after having done so, we can um, apply then machine learning algorithms. So we uh, um, optimize or we, we determine first of all, the uh, most sensitive uh, parameters uh, here in the first optimization uh, step or in the first iteration process step. Um, and then in the second step, we go uh, also for the minor uh, relevant parameters as long as we are uh, not in the car. Yeah? So when we have uh, sufficient computing time and uh, lots of um, measured data available and, and so on um, in the car, then the step one is um, what we can apply, but probably not step one or two anymore. So um, this allows us then um, based uh, on, so and, and the important thing is we're doing machine learning here, but we're applying it to physical based models. So the outcome from the machine learning are still values with physical meaning. Yeah? So these are dimensions or diffusion constants or, or concentrations or whatever. And um, whereas if we just uh, would uh, do a black box uh, machine learning with um, uh, neural networks, uh, we don't have physical meaning. Yeah? We maybe can describe the performance of the batteries very well, but uh, we hardly can optimize uh, materials or structures uh, when not knowing um, what the physical meaning uh, really uh, is. And um, we were able to show that uh, with this machine learning, we could determine the parameters even more precise than with our um, um, laboratory measurements. Um, we um, are faster in calculations. Uh, we have lower uh, errors in capacity. Um, related to parameters uh, and, and generally. Um, so we can see that there's really improvement and uh, it is um, for sure uh, significantly faster and cheaper. But, in, and yeah, so here's just one more slide uh, showing the training is based then on the um, discharge processes, constant current discharge processes. It is based on um, pulse uh, profiles and also on driving profiles. And then we can see when we test uh, all this, uh, we see that um, the, um, 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 the uh, measure, measured results uh, can be represented by the simulation based on the model with the parameters uh, determined with the machine learning very, very well. The uh, root mean square errors here for different types of driving profiles are in the order of 10, 12, milli volts and uh, for, on the cell level for sure um, and we think this is uh, pretty good for what 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 we need yeah? so here's uh, just another uh, com comparison here uh, between um, experimental parameterization and data driven parameterization and we can see that the data driven parameterization is uh, giving better results than the experimental um, parameterization and uh, this is also not unexpected uh, at the end of the day, uh, but uh, it's um, really a very helpful tool to have this now available. So to sum up um, the challenges for battery management systems and future functionality uh, will not end with what we have discussed today. Um, we talk about over the air updates, not only of parameters, but also of models. Um, we will see new sensors, uh, pressure sensors, ultrasounds, uh, online impedance spectroscopy, for example, um, glass fibers uh, doing measurements in the battery pack or maybe even in the battery cells. Um, we have uh, data driven models, uh, neural networks, uh, and uh, also more efficient data transmission and storage. Um, over the lifetime, the European Commission is uh, really forcing the car manufacturers also uh, to have the full set of information available from the battery from the beginning of production to the, to the end of life in recycling, for example. And um, it is uh, part of our work also to, do, to, to check what are the real meaningful values. 
So, and finally, if we now compare what I have just discussed, so the physical chemical models was uh, parameterized with experiments, um, the strength of this for sure, and uh, this is important. So uh, we are absolutely sure the uh, machine learning algorithms will not replace um, the uh, experimental uh, determination of parameters. So they are an additional tool because if we just have fresh materials, uh, so materials which not have been built into batteries, um, then we cannot uh, generate data which are needed for the machine learning. Then we really go for this uh, with our um, experimental analysis of the parameter values on the materials. And then we can do virtual design and uh, performance estimations are possible of battery cells. And also we can do extrapolation to even untested operating conditions. Uh, we, uh, it's more difficult to rely on uh, machine learning algorithms uh, for the extrapolation. And on the other hand, uh, the physical chemical models uh, parameterized with machine learning, um, this requires that we have the cells which we can test on test benches under different conditions or in the field. Um, and uh, but the big strength is, as I try, try to explain, is we still have a clear physical meaning of, of this. And um, we have a, a, a more precise representation of cells after the measurements. So if we have a full battery cell with us, then the machine learning is um, a very good uh, tool. If we just talk about uh, materials uh, or half cells or something like this, and if we want to really design virtually uh, battery, new battery cells from materials from a database and so on, also for different um, um, yeah, sizing of electrodes, thicknesses, uh, porosities, and so on, then um, it is helpful to have the physical measure or the experimental measurements. Yeah, and by this, I really would like to thank you very much uh, for the attention. And uh, once again, it was a great pleasure for me here to, uh, to uh, share some thoughts with you on the battery modeling and diagnostics, and I'm happy that we may have some time for some discussions now. Thank you very much. Dr. Groover, thank you very much uh, for that comprehensive talk. Um, we're a little bit running late on schedule, so if I could suggest we ask Simona and Oso to come, we can now just have the discussion. How does that sound to the both of you? That's fine. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so Dr. Groover, let me begin with the a, a, a question which might be a bit provoking. So your institute um, you know, houses a, a, a respectable amount of battery testers and industry uh, you know, has one to two order magnitude more per site uh, for their operations that 100,000 battery tester is not uncommon, but everyone, at least I speak to, always says we need more battery testers because we're making billions of battery cells uh, and the battery tester is a, is a smaller fraction. So I would like to ask you, Dr. Groover, what has limited um, the effective use of the battery cyclers? Is there a way to make use of them more efficiently? And then secondly, um, what is the bottleneck to increasing the capacity of battery testing uh, so it is not bottlenecking the R&D process and the manufacturing process? Yeah, that's um, really the most important uh, point you make. Yeah? So, and this is also one of our tasks, the question, how can we accelerate the testing on test benches? And when we look uh, to how battery cells are tested still mainly today, you apply to one cell a certain current, so typically one constant current at a certain temperature, and you go for a certain depth of discharge. And then you take two or three other cells doing the same to have the minimum statistics of three cells, yeah, which is from a statistical point of view, not enough at all, but nothing more typically happens. And then you apply a little bit higher current to the next cell and, and so on. So the first uh, question uh, we raise and where, what we are working on is uh, how can we really go for more complex uh, uh, um, testing profiles. How can we combine in one test profile different current rates, different temperatures, so taking differences. And here we work also with our colleagues from mathematics uh, to, um, to, to 
get the info, still the good information because we want to know what a certain current rate does to the battery. And we want to know what a certain temperature does because otherwise we cannot parameterize our models pr properly. Um, but uh, we, we are sure uh, the future cannot be to stay with applying just one set of applications to one cell. We have to bring all, yeah, various multi-stress profiles to, to the batteries. This is a one side, but um, then it doesn't end. Yeah? For example, until now, I, I, I would say uh, there, the number of tests which are done, for example, in co where we test electrical profiles, temperature profiles, and mechanical stress profiles at a certain point of time. And this will become much, much more relevant when we talk maybe about solid state batteries uh, with, with these uh, pure lithium electrodes. Uh, I, I fear that they will be extremely dependent on the pressure we, we apply to the battery cells and so on. So, and this needs to be combined on very expensive test benches. Uh, so we have to understand what a certain um, um, stress does to the battery um, to separate these stress um, or the, the effects from the stress uh, later on. Otherwise uh, we will die in battery testing. <laughs> Dr. Rupert, can I, I, I... I think you probably cannot answer it, but just to inspire um, the researchers in the field, how much improvement do you think there is to be made in terms of the efficiency of battery testing today? How much headroom do we have to speed it up? So, I, so the, the, our, our vision, our vision and mission for what we are going for is um, to be able to give feedback here to those who do produce uh, materials or battery cells uh, for sure, with a different level of accuracy after uh, four weeks, after eight weeks, after 12 weeks. Yeah? So within 12 weeks, we must be able to give a clear statement if a certain battery will have the ability to fulfill the requirement of lifetime in a certain application. Um, otherwise, uh, we can't uh, speed up enough. And you know, at least in Europe, uh, we are well behind the Asian battery manufacturers. So uh, our industry also have to um, uh, close a gap. And uh, if we can't help them from a scientific uh, point of view in uh, accelerating these development processes, uh, we won't be able to catch up. So, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty op uh, optimistic that uh, in, within 12 weeks by combining uh, very specific tests on test benches, uh, which go, for example, uh, the different tests have to concentrate on different aging processes, like plating, um, like uh, current distribution in the, in the battery cells, maybe maybe corrosion or what, what whatever. Um, then the post-mortem analysis was really an in-depth analysis uh, of uh, all these uh, processes to see already at the beginning, even though it does not have an effect on performance yet, if we have ruptures of crystals, uh, for example, uh, or uh, what kind of uh, um, solid electrode interface uh, is, is built. And then uh, the modeling uh, to extrapolate this all to uh, the real world operating conditions of uh, 10, 15 years in, 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 in the field. And this is, I think, what the research community has to bring together. And which is, from my point of view, the holy grail of uh, uh, battery uh, lifetime and reliability prediction and uh, testing is part of this, but it must be much different from what we are doing today. Dougrave, I completely agree and also resonate with what you and Simona um, emphasize today is what we need is more actionable insights coming from the testing. Uh, just certainly knowing whether it's going to pass or fail a certain criterion, it's utterly insufficient because it doesn't tell us um, as battery engineers and scientists how to improve the materials, how to improve the cell. Uh, so I completely, um, I completely resonate with that. Um, maybe also let me take um, some of the points you and Simona make and, uh, and, and expand on a bit. So both of you talk about battery management, online estimation. It is already a hard problem today, um, given the complexity of the battery pack, the number of individual cells involved. But we're also seeing increasingly a trend in order to increase the flexibility of design that multiple chemistry, two chemistries, are now being introduced within a single battery pack. Um, and of course, this increases the complexity of the power electronics and increases um, the need uh, for even more powerful 
uh, BMS system and the coupling of the two as well. So I was wondering if the both of you can also comment what are the opportunities and also challenges when we start going to dual chemistry battery pack um, and, and what is the trade-off here between the flexibility of design versus the complexity of implementation for such a system? Maybe I can ask Simona to weigh in on this first. Sure. Um, no, no, that's a, that's a very um, important question, Will. I wanted to add something uh, to the previous question you asked uh, just about testing. I wanted to say that uh, when it comes also to test uh, reused batteries for second life application, that increase the testing capability needs because we know less and less, uh, we know even less about those batteries than we know about fresh batteries. So I wanna say that test is gonna be a huge deal, especially for reusability and uh, uh, the purposing of those batteries. When it comes to integrate different chemistry in a battery pack, uh, I would say from a BMS standpoint, the uh, um, integration is, is, uh, is the big uh, challenge there, integrating uh, uh, the electrical behavior uh, in, in a way that you, you, you get the performance that you want to from the, from the pack. And uh, as a strategy for uh, designing BMS in that case, uh, you will just wanna start with uh, very simple electrochemical uh, equivalent circuit models. Uh, you don't want to start with electrochemical um, things, especially, I don't know, there are combinations of lithium-ion batteries, supercapacitor, lithium-ion battery, and lead-acid batteries, or different lithium-ion battery chemistry, so LFP combined with NMC. So um, the challenge is really to understand whether or not the integrated system will last and perform as desired over a long period of time, and testing really should go there. To, uh, to, to understand what the, um, you know, things needs to be tweaked and, perform, and you know, improved and, and changed. Um, and the, the other thing is also the, all the control strategy and the need modeling that needs to be revised. Uh, you know, there are different time constants that those energy storage might have. And so how to account them and how to integrate them properly. Uh, aging uh, will have different trajectories. So if you combine, for example, LFP and NMC, we know that LFP can withstand a very high C rate of operation as opposed to NCA or NMC. So uh, how do we, you know, split um, that load in an op optimal way. So there is a, an energy management problem that you can establish over there that you can do it through some active uh, control. So power electronics that helps you to, um, you know, split that power, that load uh, in, a, in an optimal way. And in order for you to do that, you need some, uh, you know, good modeling to start with, especially when it comes, you know, aging modeling, elect electrical model, and the thermal also um, model response. Thank you, Simona. Dr. Gruber, your thoughts on the dual chemistry? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add uh, from, it was an example from stationary batteries. Uh, for sure, we have looked into this also for, for mobile applications, but uh, we operate since uh, roughly six years, a five megawatt battery, and uh, which is uh, operating in the German um, grid, in grid control. So we're taking part in the auctions every four hours uh, to deliver grid services to keep the frequency at uh, 50 Hertz. And in this system, we have five different battery technologies. So we have the two lead acid batteries and we have LTO, LFP and uh, NMC uh, technology. And uh, here we, we're, we're doing exactly this. Uh, we're deciding at every second how to distribute uh, the energy to the different battery technology systems. In most, most times in frequency control, you're having five or 10% of peak power. Yeah? So if you need, 100% power for sure, you have to take all the batteries at the time. But this happens rarely, almost uh, never. Yeah? So uh, what is used is well, typically you have a relatively small thing. And this is uh, here we really have, we have a digital twin for all the batteries uh, representing on the one hand their efficiency, uh, including what does it mean for the cooling of the system uh, and include what is the efficiency of the inverters which are connected and the transformers. And on the other hand, what are the aging? What is the aging? So in every second, uh, we calculate the marginal cost for the operation of a certain battery. And then it is something like an internal auction. And uh, we say, okay, uh, now this battery will, uh, will be on, uh, online huh? and uh, the others uh, go down or step down or we, we bring it to two, three uh, strings or whatever. We have 10 battery strings, uh, which we can control individually here. 
And um, um, this is, I think this is a key. Uh, we, you need really understanding of the, um, uh, of the aging and uh, of also of the other things. And maybe in the pure battery electric vehicle, I'm not really sure that we will see too many different technologies with large batteries. If you go to 70 or 100 kilowatt hours, these batteries have sufficient power anyway. Yeah? So um, the combination of different uh, chemistries is more interesting in small batteries where power and energy ratings are of interest. But I'm absolutely sure that it will become relevant also for these type of applications because probably we will maybe change over lifetime individual modules. And then maybe even the chemistry remains the same. We will have in one battery pack uh, old uh, modules and we have new modules. Yeah? And the new modules maybe even have different chemistry because they are not produced in the same way anymore. So I think uh, the question you raise is uh, most, uh, most relevant. But in this point, I'm quite really optimistic that we can handle this uh, because uh, this has been shown and uh, um, can be done, but for sure, every more understanding of the aging. And this is again, something where uh, cloud services will help us uh, to see what, uh, has, has, uh, what, what has happened in other systems and take these informations into my specific system. Dirk Ruver, it's impressive that um, you have already been practicing this five chemistry system uh, in a life setting. Um, this is this is very, very exciting. Um, we have a couple minutes left, and I thought maybe I would end with yet another provocative question. And, and this one is a bit um, close to home, I would say. And I will begin, since I'm a professor, I shall profess and rant a little bit. Um, you know, one of the great things um, in, in the couple of years um, um, leading to today uh, with battery informatics is that more and more battery data are being shared. The Ruver, Simona, and, and myself, we have been sharing data, which is great. But I'm also seeing a concerning trend in which uh, folks are beginning to just throw, you know, every possible machine learning methods to interpret the data. And of course, not surprisingly, everybody gets great results. Um, so I think there is now this uh, um, movement in the field uh, to really uh, exploit the most out of these public data sets. But of course, these data sets are a very small fraction of what's available out there. And this can often lead to overinterpretation, overfitting, and underdelivering the models. Um, so I'm a bit curious on what your advice to the community, which are just now getting into machine learning and better informatics, what are some of the best practices to avoid this pitfall of just uh, discovering unimportant and unphysical trends, which are not really translatable uh, to the real problems uh, that's being deployed in industry? Uh, maybe, Doug, I can ask you to comment on this. Uh, I know you probably have some strong, strong thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I just want to try to ask if you ask me as an editor of a journal, <laughs> getting in a numerous number of uh, papers on similar things. Uh, um, I, I don't have a, I don't have the answer on this. Uh, I have to say I sure sure have many thoughts about this. Uh, um, maybe. Machine learning is an, an example, but even going one step before, yeah, let me say the traditional diagnostic algorithms, what I see are a huge number of papers all dealing with some equivalent circuit diagrams and some observers to, to, to go for this. Um, and so from my point of view in the community, we have to be much more critical about um, um, looking into these things. Uh, if I see an, an observer or in, in a diagnostic system, which is then verified at 20 degrees C for a new battery and uh, for, uh, for, for a well-known system, I can say, nice, but this is pure academic. Yeah? So uh, for, if the algorithm is not working on the temperature range of from minus 30 to plus 50 degrees C, and if it's not working throughout the lifetime from a fresh battery to an aged battery, we should not really accept this as, uh, as a new finding. Yeah? We have to define um, quality controls um, to really say now it is a proof that what you're doing is um, is really good. I also in machine learning, I often see papers where it is said 
uh, I now have precisely determined that this type of algorithm is the best one and the other one are not perfect. And my first question is always, do you really have optimized all the internal parameters of this machine learning algorithm or optimization algorithm? Can you really be sure that you have got the best from this if you make such a statement, uh, which of these things is the best? And the answer in most of the cases is uh, probably no. Yeah. And um, therefore, uh, I think we have to be more critical about what we're really accepting also in, in, uh, in, in the science community. And we have to, to, to draw exactly the questions you just raised yeah, to do these things, uh, to find out what are um, the real big things yeah, and uh, not to just uh, um, publish things to publish another paper. Yeah, I think the Gruber, I think that the challenge I, I personally see here too is it's very easy to do these analysis and just uh, download the data set and, and run the analysis. So the barrier is getting lower. And, and I completely agree with you that more intense innovation is needed here uh, and not just uh, uh, trying the same methods over many, many days. So sorry to, to profess a bit here, but I'm glad Dirk Gruber, you share the same concern as a, as a journal editor as well. Absolutely. So Simona, what, what are your thoughts on this? Absolutely, I'm completely aligned with, uh, with both of you. And, uh, you know, in fact, in my lab, uh, I wanted to start saying that there is a positive side of this. There is more people interested in battery. People who, who are from computer science really are um, skilled in machine learning and they, they, they approach this field, you know, through their knowledge, but they don't know much about battery. So it's, it's good in one way, and we'll see this every day, we'll write. We have so many people, students, wanting to start doing machine learning for batteries, but they don't care about the physics or the electrochemistry or understanding the underlying governing principle of these devices, which is a, a, a no, a no, no for us, right? So you really need to be uh, wanting to know how the system works because otherwise you're not gonna be able to really provide any uh, novel insight or novel discovery or anything like that. So for us, for me, my group, uh, it's, it's mandatory to have uh, an interest and a passion for how this device works in all its form, single cell, uh, manufacturing, or pack, or, or whatever uh, setting you want to, to look at. And I agree with you, there is so much uh, um, shallowness around sometimes in, in uh, um, um, applying a machine learning algorithm and uh, uh, claiming that it works. You know, as we said also from uh, Professor Sewer, you know, you, you cannot extrapolate uh, the behavior, the performance uh, uh, of those algorithms across other chemistry or, uh, you know, um, different uh, um, data set and so forth. So those uh, algorithms taken by themselves uh, uh, can be promising, but they cannot be uh, seen as the solution to BMS problems, for example. But the combination of uh, the uh, data-driven or data analytics-based method with electrochemistry, with control theory, with optimization, that is where we should be really working on. So the combination of different fields uh, is what really will lead to a big advancement improvement in the field. And do you have a paper, uh, Will, where you lay down different type of uh, structure, right? On how we can combine those different uh, uh, domains. And that's what we really should be working on with all our students and uh, also in industry. Simona and Doug Hoover, thank you both very much uh, for this brief but insightful discussion and for taking the time uh, early morning for Simona and late afternoon Friday uh, for Doug Hoover to, to share your thoughts with us. I, um, and Ian, I truly appreciate it. Um, so if I can have the closing slides, please, Evan, thank you. So this concludes the uh, winter quarter of the Storage X Symposiums. Uh, so we will return um, in April uh, with more exciting uh, speakers. So please stay tuned. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, listening in today and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. <laughs>